Make a note in your diaries for the 29th of October because the Dinosaur Hour is coming to GB News. This is a ten-part show. It's going to be on at nine o'clock on Sunday evenings, and the host is a certain John Cleese, who's been given carte blanche to create the type of show that he's always wanted to watch. And we can un unveil the promo. This is the first time it's ever been played. Right now, let's have a look. Who is it? We're here for the show. <laughs> This time. Welcome to the Dinosaur Hour. I was uh, married to a therapist. And you survived? I thought we were getting Hugh Laurie. Second best. <laughs> you interviewed Saddam Hussein. What's that like? I was terrified. I'm playing strip poker with these three. Oh! No, thank you. <laughs> My CDs need to be put in alphabetical order. Ah. Uh, Are you going to be problematic again? <laughs> The Dinosaur Hour, Sunday the 29th of October at 9 on GB News. Yes. Tell us about the show. Yes, I can. Well, it's on the 29th, which is two days after my 84th birthday. <laughs> uh, thank you. And, uh, so I will be celebrating it. I'm on tour in Akron, Ohio. It's a dream come true, John. <laughs> it is. I'm thinking of flying in all my friends and relatives to Akron for the... It's a good idea. Did you plan it that way? You wanted to be in Akron. What a dump I hate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hate Ohio. It's just all Cleveland is the worst. I've, I've been to Cleveland. You have? It was quite bad, yeah. The extraordinary thing about Cleveland is that people live there. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have to. No, they do it voluntarily. It's, yes, very, it's very strange. There's no it? sort of guards or <laughs> wire netting or anything. They could leave any time they want. I said to, my, I said to, I said to one of the guys, I said, this is awful, this place. Why do you live here? And he said, I, I can't sell my condominium. <laughs> and then he said, we have a joke here. What's, what's the difference between a Cleveland condominium and gonorrhea. <laughs> the answer is you can get rid of gonorrhea. <laughs> well, luckily, people from Ohio probably aren't watching tonight, so well, I think I we're, hope not. I think <laughs> we're pretty safe. Because you've still got tickets to sell, ultimately. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. But but the show is coming out, and of course, and I've been working on this with you, obviously, yeah. in the capacity of producer. And it, there are some amazing guests: Stephen Fry, Trevor McDonald, yes. Tim Rice. But there's also a lot of very good guests who aren't celebrities. Yes. You see, you've got to have a certain number of celebrities to get people to. Turn on, but then you can uh, you can interview people who are really interesting, and it's very hard in this. <laughs> well, it's it, well, you know, it's... Well, you know, there's an awful lot of celebrities aren't interesting at all, you know. And uh, as I say, uh, this this show is all about uh, um, it's for the out of touch. You see, <laughs> all the dinosaurs who are out of touch, because you can be out of touch for two reasons, right? You can be voluntarily out of touch because you've given up, which is a very sensible point of view, or you can be out of touch without knowing it. But it's for it's it's for those sort of people. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun film because we did huge fun. And no we did it in a Norman castle. So I think people were quite confused about that, but it, it was it was interesting. Well, it was extraordinary, but I mean the the setting. I wanted to make it look like a very very strange gentleman's club, yeah. you know, a little bit like <laughs> the bar on, on on what was that great space. Um, the Star Wars, the first Star Wars. Oh, you yes. The bar? I know exactly the bar you mean, yeah. So I wanted it to be a little bit like that because it seems to me that television falls into cliches so easily. You look at every news show. Now, what happens is you get this very elaborate um, animatronic to start with, yeah. right? And yeah. then suddenly there's everyone sitting at a desk which looks pretty much the same on any show that you're looking at. And I just wanted to create something that looked different because I thought that would start people out by saying, oh, what's this about? Yeah, and I don't want to give too much away, but the range of topics that you cover in depth and you have these yeah. very long, interesting conversations with various people, and like you say, people that well, we won't know. Well, they're speakers. What yeah. matters is, do people talk well? Now, some very bright people 
people just don't talk well. They're yes. not interesting. And other people, and we got several on, like Matthew Sayed. I don't know if you read his column in the Sunday Times. It's about the best thing in the Sunday Times. We've got him in a couple of programs. Yes. So you get get people interested in the subject, which is the normal thing on television these days. If you go on a show like what the the one show, which is a nice, happy little show, but the first thing you're not on for long, and then they tell you they want you to play some game. Nobody in <laughs> nobody in television trusts the fact that two people talking might be interesting. Okay, uh, well, we'll cancel the dartboard. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, sorry about that, John. Um, but it, it has been very interesting because you know normally when it comes, you were on Michelle Jubry's show the other day, yes. talking about how GB News said to you, "What do you want to do? Just do whatever you want." Because uh, I've done very little television because I'm completely out of touch with the people who are running television, mm -hmm. you know. And I mean, early on, I went to Netflix and I gave them six ideas, all of which I thought I thought two were really good, yeah. and two were good, and two were, uh -huh. and they never even called my agent back. And you kind of think, well, uh, what, what, what are you looking for? But are they looking for quality or innovation, or are they looking I for... I have no idea, and I don't think they know either. Well, I mean... I mean, the main thing that you know as you get older is you realise that very few people have any idea what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's true. I mean, the worst case of that was when I went off... I went on a, a weekend once uh, with an old friend uh, who used to run the Playboy Club here and put all the money up for the very first Python film, which is how I knew him. And I met somebody, American uh, television people, and they said, oh, I just, I just uh, bought the rights for 40 towers. We're going to make 40 towers in America. It's about 15 years ago. And I thought, ching, ching, you know, <laughs> ching, ching. And I said, have you made any changes? And they said, not really, no. They said, well, we've made one. We've written Basil out. <laughs> and they did. They wrote Basil out and gave all his lines to B. Arthur, who also had all of Sybil's lines. And you know, it didn't work. What a surprise. Well, well, how could they have such a truly terrible idea? That's incredible. Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, is it just that you get these committees together, these yes. executives, and they, and they sort of don't know quite what they want, but they want to duplicate success that has happened in the past, so you end up with no risk-taking, I suppose. That's right. People try always to do what's been successful in the yeah. past. And I think another thing that happened here, and Griff Reese jones wrote a very good piece about this a long time ago, maybe 15 years ago, is that the top executives now want to be the stars. Mm. You see? They want to take the credit for the ideas of the programme. Well, what they need to do, if I was in charge of the BBC, I'd say, who do I think is really good, really great? Eddie Izzard, for example. I'd say, Eddie, what do you want to do? Yeah. And is there anyone you've always wanted to work with? Because if there is, we'll send you off for a, a free weekend and you can just sit and have a nice time and see if there's a show you want to do. In other words, you want the creativity to come from the creative people, but on the whole, they don't trust you. Now, sometimes they give me a, a, a show, and then they immediately ask me what I'm going to be doing, and I say, I don't know yet. Because I believe creatively you mustn't make your mind up too soon. I suppose if they did that and they just trusted the creatives, you'd end up with the occasional thing that just didn't work. Oh, yes, because if you but... try to be creative, you're going to make mistakes. Because the whole point is when you're creating something new, you haven't been there before. Yeah, yeah. So you don't know. So you're going to have a few failures, but you're also going to have some real successes. But you've talked about this before, that you had this kind of uh, opportunity with the, Monty Pi with the first Monty Python oh, series. it was fantastic. And so far as you could do whatever you wanted. Well, we went in to see them because I'd suggested to the guys the others the, who were doing a show called uh, Do Not Adjust Your Set, which was a kids' program, went out at six o'clock. Graham Chapman and I were writing for Peter Sellers back in those days. Right. And we rang him up and said, let's do a show together. And then Marty Feldman's writing partner fixed up a, an interview with a guy called Michael Mills, who was the head of Light Entertainment. And we went in to see Michael. And uh, he said, I, like, I gather you'd like to do a series. And we said, we'd love to. And he said, well, what, what do you propose doing? And you won't believe this, 
we hadn't discussed it. <laughs> Can you believe that? Going into a pitch meeting. <laughs> so we kind of said, well, we're going to try and make a humorous program with jokes, you know, to make people laugh and, and, and gags. Very specific. <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> and we went on like this for a bit, and he said, you're going to have, um, are you going to have uh, guest stars? We said, are we? Are we going to have guests? <laughs> and I said, what about music? We said, oh, music, that's a good idea. It was a disaster. <laughs> and he looked at us pityingly, <laughs> and he said, go away and make 13 programmes. <laughs> Unbelievable. But then when it, when it comes to Faulty Towers, that seems like something that was very planned or very structured. Well, it was very... fairly planned. I mean, I went out to dinner with Jimmy Gilbert, who directed me in The Frost Report with the two Ronnies and, and David Frost. Yes. And uh, I, he, he said, well, what do you want to do after Python? I said, I'd like to do something with my wife, Connie Booth. And he said, what? I said, I don't know. And he said, well, go back and talk and let me know and I'll commission it. Isn't that incredible? That level of trust. Extraordinary. I mean... <laughs> and then I said, oh, well, we, we've stayed in a hotel in Torquay. We like to write about that. Yes. So he said, OK, and he commissioned it, and we made it. But they trusted us. They trusted us, except after the first show. He said to me, John, you're going to have to get them out of the hotel more. Oh. <laughs> Terrible idea. You know? I mean, we, we were talking about this the other night, but I did find it astonishing when you told me that so many of the critics were against Faulty Towers when it came out. Oh, they didn't and... like it. It was all Daily Mirror uh, said uh, Long John short on jokes. Yes. Uh, the Spectator <laughs> hated it, well, Spectator magazine. Yeah. And it was, it was some time, because if you do anything very new, it does make some, it takes some time for people to get used to it and decide, oh, I like it or I don't like it. But at the beginning, it was like Monty Python. The, the, the critics couldn't, couldn't make anything of Monty Python. Yes. So they described what happened in the program without <laughs> saying whether it was good or bad. Yes. And then, after the first series, a lovely guy called Alan Corrin, who used to be the editor of Punch, he wrote a very nice review in The Times, and suddenly everyone decided it was a good show. <laughs> <laughs> It's all very random, and there's a lot of luck involved. Yeah, uh, is that the case with your films as well, with Fish Called Wonder and that kind oh, of thing? Oh, yes, yes. No, MGM told me it was the most terrible title. And, and, <laughs> seriously. Really? Oh, yes, they were completely against What did they it. want to call it? I can't remember. <laughs> so... but I cannot, but this is the problem. As they say, very few people know what they're doing. Yeah. And you, it takes you... <laughs> when you get older, it takes you some time to realise that most people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> there are always literal-minded people amongst us, you yeah. know, and they're not playing with the full deck. <laughs> but, we, but we have to sort of humour them. There was a great example recently. Uh, Oxfam put out a pamphlet <laughs> Uh, advising the people who work for Oxfam about how to talk to people, and they said, don't, if you support their ideas, don't say that you stand with them because it may upset people who are unable to stand. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, on that note, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but uh, Dinosaur Hour, 29th of October, I'm really looking forward to that October, going out. Yes, and give it a chance. Have a look at the yeah. first two. Yeah. And the first one is particularly good because it is critical of the press, <laughs> the right-wing press. And I did that first because some people thought that uh, because I was doing a show for GB News, I'd always been a closet Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there we are. That's the bit that's going to get clipped and put online. Uh, but thank you very much, John Cleese.